Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Broadcast to Post, Keycode Media's series hosting industry professionals discussing broadcast and production technology topics that you care about. We also invite partners to provide brief presentations around their solutions to today's challenges in our industry. I'm Jeff Sangpil, Chief Technologist here at Keycode Media. Keycode Media Systems Integrator with a small army of engineers specialized in broadcast, post-production, and audiovisual solutions. If you need equipment, we have it. If you have a complex problem, we've likely solved it. If you need support, our engineers are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In this episode, we wanted to check in and see how Avid Technology is providing solutions to help media production teams affected by the coronavirus transition to remote workflows. We will then bring on a panel of industry experts, folks from large-scale post-production operations supporting huge media composer and Pro Tools teams. We'll discuss with the panel their transition strategies. First, when work from home became a reality, and now where things are today over a month later. We all know the core methods that everyone began to use were lift and drag it all home, put all the data on drives and take the equipment all home. Remote access used tools and systems to keep everything back at the ranch, but editing away from remote thin clients. Lift and shift to the cloud, putting it all in cloud data storage and compute cores, and then controlling that remotely, your virtual ranch where it all is stored. And now using newer web-based tools for assisting the editorial process, streaming video, creating cut lists, marking footage, moving certain tasks away from dedicated editorial systems, making a remote, distributed workflow much simpler to achieve. Now that we've set the ground rules for what remote production options exist today, let's dive into our main topic, how to move Avid Media Production to remote workflows. Before we get into the presentation, we invite all of you to participate in a live Q&A. Please submit your questions via the Vimeo, Facebook Live, or YouTube chats. We'll try our best to answer all of them. Joining us today to go over Avid's remote solutions and changes to non-traditional workflows will be Dave Colantuni, Vice President of Product Management, and Matt Schneider, Product Designer at Avid Technology. They're here to discuss what solutions Avid has to keep folks working in today's shifting editorial environments. Gentlemen, thanks for taking the time to join us today, and congratulations on the release of Media Composer 2020 this week. What other things have you and the team been up to? Oh boy, <laughs> it's been quite a couple of um, weeks and months here since um, the COVID virus has um, taken over our country and our world. So we've been really doing a lot of work to make our customers understand a lot of the workflows that we support today. We've been taking a lot of um, a lot of questions like you guys have over a key code around different um, different workflows around remote working, distributed workflows, working from home, those sort of things. In addition, in addition to all of the different things that we have going on in our company, like releasing Media Composer um, yesterday, and we actually released a version of editorial management, or it's coming up today, um, and so forth. So we have a lot of stuff going on. And uh, yeah, it's been quite, quite, a, quite a ride. Very cool. So um, you want to get started with uh, Edit On Demand? So one of the questions we get quite often is, well, what are the things that we can do in the cloud? And, you know, we've, we've been talking about the cloud for a number of years at Avid, and we've been working through and actually, um, we, we've actually been doing um, a number of things to take our existing workflows and sort of deploy them in, a, in cloud situations. And so a lot of the key components of when we introduced Nexus a few years ago was around software defined workflows. And so we know that um, when we were kind of looking ahead a few years ago that the cloud would be here, there would be some reason for us to do that sort of thing. And um, yeah, we're here now and Edit On Demand is exactly proof point that we can do that. We can actually work in a cloud environment. It's powered by the cloud, storage is in the cloud, and you're literally just using a virtualized media composer in order to do your editing. Now, the edit on demand right now, um, we've really tried to make sure that people understand, our customers understand exactly what it's for. And that means that it's a complete virtual production environment. You can edit. The experience is very similar um, to how you work on-prem as far as editorial goes. Media Composer works the same. 
it gives you the collaboration experience. And that's really where Media Composer excels. Um, it allows you to um, you know, collaborate with your team members, access to your storage and things like that. We provide things like accelerated um, media upload and download. So we use a product called File Catalyst that allows people to upload their media. There, it's super simple around pricing. People kind of set this world of transition of, oh, I know I buy editorial seats, I buy Media Composer, I buy Nexus and it costs this much. People get confused when you start talking about, well, now you're billed per month and now there's overage fees and things like that. So we've taken our pricing, we've tried to make it simple for people to understand as they go through this transition. And then scale, um, we start with about 30 seats of Media Composer and then we give you a certain amount of storage and you go from there. And we scale only to 30 seats today, that's 30 connected clients at the same time. We'll be able to scale more in the future. So it's been quite a success. It's, it's been um, something customers ask a lot about and um, it's just another path on sort of where we've been with our remote workflows and that started with Media Central and so forth um, and has continued on to editorial on demand. So that's where we are today. Hopefully I answered your question. Um, Matt at, at Media, Media Composer Editorial Management, what's going on? All right, hey Jeff, good to speak with you. Um, so I can certainly uh, share my slides as well. Um, so editorial management, uh, just to tee this up, um, Editorial management is very much um, a major part of what we are calling the post-production pipeline. Uh, Avid's been in, you know, right in the middle of this for three decades now. And over time, our, our ability to have an impact and support the various aspects of what ultimately has always been a pipeline is coming clearer into view. Um, and one of the things that, one of the big themes that we are talking about this year is how we do have so, so many nodes of this overall pipeline under our supervision, so to speak. Um, and we want to continue to educate the customer base on how these options are available. Editorial management really, in many respects, can be the centerpiece of all of this. Um, it is, it was designed years ago uh, with remote workflows in mind, long before remote workflows really became the dire necessity that they are today. But the idea has always been, the mission statement has always been for editorial management to provide uh, a lightweight, easy to, easy to digest, accessible interface to see everything that's on your nexus, whether you're in a brick and mortar environment or more relevant to present day, uh, remote and outside of traditional brick and mortar environments. Uh, and we want that accessibility to, to be occupied in the form of a very simple lightweight browser experience. So the browser experience gives not only um, uh, a view of everything that's on your Nexus, regardless of any particular Media Composer project, um, but also gives a lot of the organizational uh, and, and prep uh, organizational tools that a producer or a story editor or even assistant editor need uh, to really get their project off the ground. So um, much of the capabilities that you get historically in Media Composer are now extended into editorial management. And again, again, in this very lightweight, easy to digest form. Um, in editorial management, just to go a little bit more specifically into the functionality, the currently available functionality, uh, there's a browse app that gives, gives you a, a tree view of everything on your Nexus. Uh, predicated on your Nexus user, of course. Um, it gives you the ability to create Media Composer bins. This is not a facsimile of a bin, this is an actual Media Composer bin that you are physically creating in the browser. And it's extremely simple to do, anyone can do it. Uh, so you can create bins, you can uh, organize content into bins, you can create sub clips, you can create group clips. Um, and more interesting is where a producer or a story editor or anyone who's really starting to build the narrative uh, can find content based on a pretty sophisticated search engine that's built into editorial management, searching based on either metadata found in any Media Composer bin column, or more specifically based on a phonetic index. It's the phrase find capability that people have enjoyed for a long time uh, brought into editorial management. Once you do a search for your content, you can then drop uh, selects into a very simple rough assembly timeline. So even though it's a, a web, web page effectively, you can create a simple rough cut or um, a basic assembly uh, with the intent being that you're going to hand off that rough assembly to a craft editor. Um, so a lot of these organizational things that have been in Media Composer are now available in this uh, editorial management tool set. And most importantly, it's accessible from really anywhere in the world um, uh, outside of traditional brick and mortar environments. Awesome. Um, you said there's a new version dropping today. What new features does that version bring sure. to the table? 
very excited about this. So uh, yesterday, as Dave said, was Media Composer 2020.4. Today is Editorial Management 2020.4. Um, 2020.4 is largely characterized by a lot of stability, uh, stability improvements, bug fixing, hardening, making the product more reliable, uh, more consistent, more predictable. But one of the things that I'm very excited about is we've really learned through our customers and through direct feedback from the customer base that opening up, one of the things that people want to do the most and the most frequently is they want to open up sequences that were edited inside Media Composer. It's sort of the natural instinctive thing to do. And in particular, if you're a producer or story editor, one of the most critical things that you're going to do in the course of a day is you're going to review the cut, the cut that it, uh, as it exists at that moment in time. And you're going to want to review that cut and provide markers or loca locators or offer um, uh, review of that cut. And so what we're finding is that some of the sequences that are edited on in Media Composer are so rich and so, and so complex that in some cases they may exceed the complexity of what a web page can offer. So we're introducing in 2020.4 a classification system that runs in the background. Uh, and what it will do is when the end user opens up that bin and loads the sequence into the editorial management timeline, um, they're going to get one of three experiences. Um, if the sequence is simple enough, either if it hasn't really been edited a lot in Media Composer or if it's still on that shot list stage, um, the producer or story editor can continue to edit with that sequence right in the browser. If it's too complicated to display all the richness and all the granularity of the timeline in the browser, what we then do is we uh, classify that sequence in such a way that the content can still be played and still be reviewed. So this is ideal for someone who's a producer or story editor who doesn't necessarily need or want to see all that uh, granular richness in the timeline. You know, they're not really concerned with how many layers of video it is or where the edit points are necessarily. Their job is to review it and, and to add notes and pass those notes on to the, the other members of their, of their team or to, directly to the editor. So that's something that we introduced to, literally today in editorial management. Um, and if the sequence is way too complex um, to open up in the browser, uh, we have a strategy in place that we're currently working on uh, to make that sequence open, uh, something that you can open from anywhere in the world. So that's that's the next step for us um, in this ongoing in this ongoing process. So it's a lot of these uh, robust stability improvements to make the experience more predictable uh, and more reliable, especially considering that the workflows are now uh, almost 100% done uh, remotely. And then a follow up on that um, with EM, what's necessary to get this scaled up? and deployed for, say, a typical reality TV show, 25 producers, they want to get cracking on uh, digesting content and getting that ready for, you know, getting roughs kind of done. Sure. Well, actually, if um, 25 users currently, that is something that we support now. The uh, the C count limit is, uh, at the moment is 25. Uh, we have plans in place to scale that uh, quite dramatically, potentially up to 75 or even 100 users. Um, not exactly sure when we when we'll be able to offer that, but that is part of the roadmap. Um, and the idea is that we'll be able to scale the not only the um, distribute the computational strain on the server that manages all uh, manages the back end, um, but also to offer some of the components of editorial management on potentially some of the workstation hardware that other other users may have. <clears throat> so the idea is to make the product over time. Uh, more scalable and more distributed in terms of the strain that would otherwise be placed on the server when you when you start to put a lot of users on it. Um, does that answer the question? That it does. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Dave, getting into edit and demand, what's the typical spin up time to bring, say, a typical uh, 80 terabytes of Nexus, six edit stations? Um, what's the time and local, likely total cost? For a configuration like this, figure 60 hour a week per edit team? Yeah, um, I'll give you the cost. I believe it's about $3,000 um, a month for the um, for that configuration that I talked about. It doesn't take very long to spin it up. Um, I think there's, um, there is a little bit of an engagement you do with Avid. We have a whole, um, we call it a cloud practice who actually will go out and talk to customers and um, realize their environment and they will, you know, they'll set them up and get all the, all the users um, going on it. But it doesn't take all that much to actually get going on. It. It's pretty quick. Um, if it's a more, we also have the ability to do a more integrated um, custom engagement, which we some people today in Hollywood that are doing that. Um, on their own. I can't name who they are, but they are. We've done specific um, 
specific engagements with them where we have some custom engineering that gets them. We have the ability to do that too, because they have a specialized workflow they need to take care of. Um, so overall, it's it you know the time to spin up a, a team of thirty and you know a, a bunch of storage is not that complicated. It doesn't take that long. It is an engagement that you call us and we you know we talk to you about what you want to do, who you're going to put on it, and that sort of thing. Very cool. Um, I had I think I had beta tested a version of that at, at it on demand a little while back. What version of Media Composer is provisioned in the configuration, and can you upgrade or change that that version? Yeah, so there's, um, you know, when we started out, we were working on the 2019 version. We've now um, allowed the older version in 2018 because one of the, some customers have moved forward to the newer UI, but some customers are still hanging back on the older UI, the 2018 version. So they, in this crisis, in this virus, they needed to learn and spin up very quickly. They didn't want to put a whole cloud environment and the new version of Media Composer in front of them. So you can use either the older versions or the new version on it. Very cool. Um, one thing, data repatriation or <clears throat> post-production back to school, eventually that's going to happen. So can projects be migrated between edit on demand and on-prem? Um, there are ways to get, yes, it's a great question. Um, because there's, it absolutely can. Um, so you'll have to, we'll, we'll have a way to get your media back down to where you own it, or you could archive it in the cloud if you need to. Um, what sits behind, interesting enough, um, Nexus Cloud is a fully operational Nexus. Um, and interestingly enough, we actually have Nexus Cloud Archive um, as part of the Nexus Cloud environment. So you can actually deploy an archive and we actually provide APIs that sit behind the scenes in order for you to do that. So you can keep things in the cloud if you want. We can get them back down for you and store them back on-prem. So one, one other question, is there any plans to integrate editorial management into Edit On Demand so you don't have to have necessarily, you know, 30 media composer users, but you could have 15 and then 15 producer stations on MCEM. The whole process will be to eventually take editorial management and all of the asset management systems and bring them online and running in Azure. Um, in fact, we have some of those things running today, but they're not part of the early access program. So we'll bring those online as our customers. We learn from our customers how to use them. Um, so we're, we're being very cautious about how we do this. Um, but um, we're accelerating that. And editorial management's on the docket to be done. Um, Matt knows that because he's helping me design it. Um, so yeah. Very cool. Um, I want to thank you guys for taking the time today to you know dial in from home and, and join us on Broadcast to Post. Uh, uh, let's get on to our panel. All right, now let's catch up with three clients who began the pandemic with three different Avid Edit at Home Scale, Edit at Scale at Home solutions. Uh, first, Mark Rodanis, Senior Vice President of Post Production for Buna Murray Productions. When we last spoke at pre NAB, well, that really was NAB, you'd started working from home, the work from home adventure with the get your media on drives, grab the gear you need, and head for your house approach. Thanks for joining us, and where are things for Buna Murray right now? Thanks. Uh, SneakerNet has been very good to us. Um, if we can go back in time about seven weeks, you know, nobody knew this was coming. Everybody was caught unprepared, unaware, uh, ourselves included. And we felt that the best thing to do was get out the door as quick and fast as possible. And that was SneakerNet. So we did that. Uh, we're now seven weeks in. I'm proud to say we have not missed a single delivery or air date in that. And we probably delivered five, ten episodes for a couple of shows that were in progress. So it's worked out really well. But it seems like every day that goes by, there's a new solution that's offered. There's a new tool that's out there. So it's been a learning process for us all along the way. And if this happened today, rather than seven weeks ago, I might take a different approach to what we did. Uh, but for us, SneakerNet has been pretty good. Understandable. Uh, 
second. Jake J. Nigro is the vice president of Christie's Editorial, full service edit rental and editorial solutions provider here in Burbank. Christie's has been utilizing remote connectivity with some conversion of operating systems to facilitate a full editorial experience for post pros at home. Uh, How is life in the continuing to work world of Christie's? Hey, um, it's it's been pretty good. We're in a, a bit of a unique scenario because we not only have facilities for ourselves, we've got about 75 edit bays across five buildings, but we also have uh, 200, 250 systems throughout LA that we support. So one way or another, we were trying to get as many of those uh, shows and production companies and facilities continually operating throughout the course of the shutdown. <clears throat> we were fortunate enough to kind of be a little bit more on the cusp of uh, uh, having the conversation how to do that slightly earlier than uh, some. So that gave us the option to kind of research a little bit. <clears throat> all in all, what we ended up doing was a bit of a hybrid. We had, uh, similar to what Mark was referring to, we were just sneaker netting and a lot of shows just dumped media to drives. And, um, you know, we were in a position where we can always provide support to all of our clients 24 seven, but all of them at the same time became a very different scenario. So, a lot of them took it upon themselves to do that copying, facilitate getting those drives, that kind of thing. Uh, but then we also started implementing uh, an you know, RGS approach for remote access, which we'll, I'm sure, get into a little bit more. Um, but that gave us flexibility to kind of have a high model where their editorial and story or just story could work remotely off of the Nexus in a facility on-prem and then have uh, uh, editorial oftentimes work from drives. Uh, I'm sure we'll dig into some of the details, but all in all, it was uh, complicated and it was a mad scramble. And towards the end, it was just a matter of trying to keep people's jobs. And uh, it was less about making money. It depends on which you know companies or vendors we're talking with. But everyone was so unbelievably supportive in the process and sharing information to uh, uh, not only from a technical perspective facilitate getting you know the VPN established and getting all these other processes uh, in, in in tech. But also just, hey, I noticed this works better for me if I do it this way or, or, or that kind of thing. So um, just along with really the whole community, it was, a, it was a pretty impressive thing that a lot of different companies turned around simultaneously. And, and we're in that model now, that kind of hybrid uh, uh, from home and, and remote. Very cool. Uh, and th- third, Scott Randall the VP of Technology and Workflow at Max Post. I know Scott's been using a mixed remote control editorial and is one of the inaugural users of Media Central Editorial Management. He's been working closely with them to get any kink cleared up. Uh, Scott, how goes the fight? Well, uh, thank you. We're, we're, still, uh, we're still in it. Um, things, have, uh, things have gotten a lot smoother. You know, when we first uh, went out, um, <clears throat> you know, we had used um rgs before in a, in a really limited fashion late last year so we'd had sort of a test for it but we weren't sure it was going to scale to to what we needed to keep everyone going and keep all our shows going so um we initially sent two shows out um using uh mark's sneaker net and once we realized that we were able to scale up uh rgs then we we actually pulled one of those shows back their drives back and put them on on remote. So now we have about 85 uh, users on RGS every day, um, which was not terrible. The biggest challenge really there was the home user uh, internet and and setup and you know not having monitors and all that kind of thing. Um, and um, we also have uh, interplay. We have a few users actually using. Um, um, a media central um, UX uh, and and using interplay for that, and then yeah, we've we've have uh, tutorial management installation uh, that we're working with the beta team on every day uh, to try and make that work for reality television production. Um, still not quite there for the holy grail of uh, multi groups. Uh, Matt Schneider will know that's my. Um, my holy grail, uh, 100%. <laughs> but we're we're working and hoping that we can get there. It'll be a huge uh, asset for us to be able to deploy that uh, in addition to all the other remote workflows. Awesome. So 
Getting into this, um, I've got this time machine here. It looks suspiciously like a key code coffee cup. It lets each of you send a message to yourself back on the weekend after Thanksgiving 2019. What does that message say, having learned what you have this year so far? JJ, let's start with you, and then we'll work around the horn. I would start with buying stock in Zoom, and then I would probably uh, look at – Everything from creating uh, VMs in, uh, you know, off of servers on-prem to really create the virtual environment that would be the robust kind of platform that we would have uh, established had we known. Um, I would also probably look a little bit deeper into uh, RGS as, um, uh, you know, purchasing the actual HP machines, which we did for quite a few of them. We've got about uh, 100 and something running, but all in all, some of them are converted Macs, and that's a little bit more uh, uh, trying. So somewhere between those two. But I think if we had time to do the legwork, it would be really kind of trying to establish the, the long-term model as opposed to this mad scramble that we've all referred to. Awesome. Mark, you had your hand up. Yeah, Jeff, I want to take a moment to give a shout-out to Key Code Media and you guys because throughout Absolutely. the whole thing, you have been a source of information. You've had these sort of forums, many people connecting with Avid. You, you know, JJ talked about less commercial and more help, and you guys have really sort of stepped it up and have become a source of information for the community. And for that, thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. Very much so. Agreed, yes. Well, thank you. Um, Scott, what's your message going to say? Uh, it would say find out what all your home users have for Internet and tell them to upgrade it. Um, if they don't own a, a, a monitor, spend 150 bucks and go buy a computer monitor. Um, and, you know, like JJ said, just looking at, more long term it's sort of what we're doing now um we are anticipating or planning we don't anticipate we hope nothing happens but we're planning that we may all if we all come back in in the next few weeks we may all have to go out again in october um and that is a very real possibility so we're we're planning for that um so that we don't have the same mad scramble that we just had so that long term is the key Mark? Yeah, you know, to answer the question, what would I do differently six weeks ago? Um, I'm the biggest Mac fanboy there is. I've been on Macs forever, and that's my uh, OS of choice. But because of that, what caught me unaware was, because I don't work on, P I have a PC at work for email and stuff like that, but I don't work on it creatively. And I was unaware of how far ahead HP with RGS and, and Lenovo with some of the, you know, how far ahead some of the PC-based remote solutions are compared to a Mac. And number one, that pisses me off. Number two, uh, I wish Cupertino would heed this and add, I mean, it seems like it's not that difficult to do, add that to the OS and have that become a part of the problem because part of the process, because most of our creatives prefer working on the Mac platform, but a lot of the things that we're talking about, even some of the Avid solutions are PC only, and that creates a conundrum. So I wish six weeks ago, I was more aware of that and maybe that would color our makeup of the fleet. JJ mentioned, you know, some Mac, some, not, you know, anyway, that's my I wish I knew that when answer to your question. Yeah, that, that, that's been the fun part because also all the cloud workflows that are available, none of them exist as, as Mac options. Legally, Mac doesn't let people do that. And that's been that's been a real sticking point for a lot of folks. Um so you know, as this goes on and you know, things are changing day to day, but as things do begin to return to as they were. What do you see is going to be your challenges to reintegrate and repatriate your data? Scott, let's start with you. Yeah. You right. didn't have your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think we'll have a huge issue with that. Like I said, right now we only have one show out on drives. Um, everyone else still working off, you know, the same on-prem nexus. Um 
but it is going to be a concern. We were talking about that yesterday, um, you know, making sure we get all that media back and all those projects back uh, and get them archived. And because the next thing that that show is going to want is in two months when they pick up again, is they're going to want all that stuff. And then we're going to say, well, it's at your house where you left it. Um, so getting a plan to retrieve all that stuff. But I, I don't think for us it'll be a huge a huge problem. Uh, JJ? Uh, you know, I would say that obviously it, it, organization is always key in these situations. And uh, when you have a good, solid team underneath of AEs and, and media management people, that's always going to be the, the the linchpin. You know, you're only going to be as strong as that, that weakest link. And what I've been seeing is if, um, you know, obviously RGS, this is what we alleviate with, with RGS. We just walk back in the building and start working. That's why it's fantastic. And you get to have all of the, you know, bin level locking and everything that you would need from, you know, working in the Nexus environment. But when you're working on drives, uh, what, what we've been seeing is daily. I mean, and, and, and again, we don't, we, we represent a ton of different production companies. So, uh, generally at the end of the day, an editor is, um, uh, you know, uploading their cut via whatever Dropbox they want to utilize. And that's getting repopulated on the Nexus and making sure that essentially what editors are working on on drives at home are being emulated uh, or essentially mirrored uh, at the facility. So everything goes according to plan and, you know, rarely does that happen. They would be able to just walk in and start working in the capacity that they, that they should be used to, to working. Um, Things will always happen, but that is the, the the plan right now has been to maintain the the nexus as if at any minute we're going to go back in and, and start working off of it. Very cool, Mark. We will never go back to the way it was before. The genie is out of the bottle. People love not getting in the car and driving, myself included. We at Bino Murray are working long and hard on a work from home policy moving forward, not only just for editorial, but everybody company wide. So the idea that two weeks from now we're going to be back to normal is a fallacy. It's a fantasy. And we have proven over the last six, seven weeks we can do it. So what, you know, why do we now suddenly have to go back into the building? Why do we, you know, it, for me, for our teams, it's all about flexibility, a hybrid home and away sort of approach. And I look at it as a competitive advantage for any other, um, well, we're all competing for a lot of the same talent, editors, colorists, you know, that sort of thing. If you are good enough to be on our radar, you're going to have options of other places you could work. So wouldn't we want to give somebody the option to work at home if possible and if, honestly, uh, as an option? That, to my mind, is a competitive advantage. So we're not going back to normal. That's just my opinion. Very cool. So we're going to jump into the Q&A coming from uh, Facebook, Vimeo, and YouTube. Uh, Rejoining us are Matt and David from Avid. And um, we'll go through these uh, questions, and we'll try to knock them out until until I'm given the, the given the yank to go. Uh, first question it looks like it's for Mark. Uh, what are the limitations of sneaker net? <clears throat> what could you have chosen something else instead? I think we yeah. Uh, six weeks ago, you know, no. <laughs> now, absolutely, we've talked about RGS. Um, you know, bandwidth dependent, meaning if you have a home residential connection that is really bad, you're not going to get the optimum user experience. Um, we're experimenting right now with something called Resilio Sync, which is very promising as far as if you have a sneaker net uh, setup, it uses BitTorrent technology to basically push out all of the, the media everywhere else. And so far, so, you know, so good. So you can maintain essentially a sneaker net scenario with a syncing of media. Moving forward in the future, um, I like a PCO, PC over IP solution like Teradici. Um, perhaps RGS is in our future, but you have to be in for a penny, in for a pound. You can't just have four editors and a 30-team group be remote. It's everybody. 
So that changes the complexion of, of our fleet makeup as well. You can't just have three editors working over RGS and five others on sneaker net. That's a recipe for confusion. So I don't know if I answered the question, but that's my thoughts. Uh, I think you did. Um, so um, Doug Ryan had a question. Uh, this was from earlier during the, the Abbott portion uh, talking about, I think talking about editorial management. Is this presentation totally dependent upon having Nexus? Yes. <laughs> well, editorial management is entirely predicated on having Nexus. Nexus is, um, in essence, the dongle of editorial management. At the moment, editorial management requires Nexus storage. Okay. And then part two of that question. Will edit on demand be available for? Will edit on demand, if available for everyone, does this group think it will fix the multi-group problem? Is edit on demand from Avid ready for prime time? Um, it's it's not. It's it's getting close, and um, our goal. We I, well, actually, I should probably amend that. It is actually being used in productions today, very, very, very large um, motion picture productions. Um, but it's still, uh, the, the technology itself um, is still in its infancy, so we're continuing to refine it. Um, but yeah, it's ready for prime time in that we have customers actually using it today, um, and we still have work to do on it too, so admittedly, there's still some work to go there. Very cool. Uh, and then part three, and I think... Mark already touched on this. Does the panel feel that this is a paradigm shift for the industry? Is it a possibility that half or most of the post-editorial and finishing workforce never comes back to the office? ROI and cost offset of brick-and-mortar post-location cost? JJ? Well, I can say it's definitely an interesting time to be in the facility business. So there's that. Um, I think, you know, I think all in all, uh, Mark has a very, he's, he's exactly correct that it's not going to go back to the way it was. You're always, now people are recognizing the value of being able to do that work re remotely. Yes. My, my feeling just talking between a, a number of different companies and having our facility itself is that it'll come back to a bit of a hybrid. You know, um, we do see some overall efficiency uh, that suffers by working off of, uh, you know, working remotely. We call it basically the 85% rule. We're trying to get people to about 85% of what they were before. 15% is a very big margin when you're paying editors what you're paying. I mean, it's 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 a lot. So it's, it's worth it to consider bringing everybody back. Um, I, I would say that what I anticipate is the, the biggest shift being uh, story. I think story, if we, particularly obviously an unscripted, story will, for one, they're generally congregated in smaller, uh, uh, you know, facilities and smaller spaces where they're kind of working at big desks together. That's going to be one of the first things we're going to want to nip in the bud and get them to work, you know, from home. So, and that process works pretty easily, especially with RGS. It's a lot better to be working, you know, doing string outs and, and that kind of thing via RGS. Um, so I think story and bullpen space and that, that kind of thing is going to, to, to shift. Um, when it comes to some of the collaborative aspects of working together on a project, there will always be, I think, a need to be, you know, in the same room eventually. But you touched on finishing and, you know, there are a lot of finishing options that we're seeing that we're utilizing for remote, uh, you know, watch downs of cuts, including, you know, real 10 bit, you know, uh, 4K color accuracy, emulating the, the, the finishing room. So, uh, there will absolutely be a paradigm shift. It will absolutely change the way people work. But I do think that there's that there is going to be a, um, particularly because a lot of facilities have already invested in in their in home. I mean, their in office uh, equipment. Uh, I think there will be you know people will come back and people will start working together, but it will look very different from what it did uh, uh, you know seven weeks ago. You're muted, Jeff. Can't hear you. There you go. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> always happens once. Um, that, that, that's, if, if that was on your bingo scorecard for Zoom bingo, you win. Um, so any other follow-ups? on? Um, I, I agree with what uh, JJ just said. Um, maybe we use all those empty movie theaters as places to play cuts and display, you know? There you go. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's not, it's, 
it, maybe it's not an entire paradigm shift, but it's certainly there's going to be a, a, a portion of the way that business was always done that has to change. Um, that story producer group bullpen thing that's you know so common and that that's just not going to fly, especially for the next you know could be a year. Um, so, and I yeah. think that also like the it's not only going to be pushed from possibly the facility perspective or the production company perspective. I think you're going to have the talent, you know, the editors or the story people just demanding it and saying, I, I can be just as efficient from home and I don't, I want to be physically distant from other people. So despite the fact that we're allowed to go back in, I think you're still going to get people that are, are not going to want to do so and you're going to sure. want to keep them on board. So it's going to be interesting to see what, you know, challenging for companies that had no remote capability at all and sort of had to just stop, um, you know, how those companies are going to function going forward. Yeah, and that, those are some of the discussions I've been having, continuing to have with people. And my, my thinking, you know, because there was a glut right at the beginning, and everybody had to get it out, and it's like, why are we still having this discussion? Oh, yeah, because everybody hasn't come to a real solution necessarily for the long-term haul. Mark, you had your hand up. I have a question for Dave. I talked to Dave last, uh, you know, well, maybe seven, eight weeks ago. I, I, I talked to you right before this happened. I, exactly. I was picking that up. Um, And I don't think any of us at that time realized how bad this was going to be. So my question to you, Dave, is, you know, how has this altered Avid's thinking about the all, you know, everything that you're working on? Um, You know, has it become a much more critical focus rather than bug fixes and and feature, you know, things? Is, Is this really sort of altering the landscape as far as what Avid is thinking about editorial? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's absolutely altered our thinking. We've already realigned a lot of our roadmaps um, just to um, improve some of the experiences we have. Somebody talked uh, a little bit earlier, Scott talked a little bit about um, Media Central and we editorial management and so forth. But absolutely, this is a a P1 priority for us because I don't think the world is going back to the way it was either, much like you guys are stating and um we need to do work in order to make sure that you can have seamless workflows um like you have just in your um post-production situation so absolutely have realigned a lot of our our roadmaps to this for every and by the way it's everything from sibelius <laughs> music notation you know all the way up to um news production has has been sort of renovated for for the cloud and remote and distributed workflows i so, still remember the panic in your voice mark <laughs> it was real <laughs> do you miss nab I, I did actually i missed it i miss seeing you too so my feet didn't miss it yeah. um so one one question uh, there's two different questions here that are, that are all along the same vein Bill is asking a question for the panel. How are studios reacting to working in the cloud? What are the security implications? And then Albert also asked, question for the whole panel, how are you ensuring the security of your assets? Anybody? I'll I'll, I'll jump. Um, The good news is we do not have to adhere to MPA security restrictions. I acknowledge and recognize that, you know, we're not working on major blockbusters. So our concerns are much less, much different. So what I say is does not uh, does not apply to people that are working in those environments. Because of that, um, we were focused on survival and not security. It was more important. Somebody earlier said we're trying to save jobs. We took our systems and said, take this go out the door, we'll figure out how to get it back later. Um, You know, if we lost a system along the way, so be it. But we were able to keep many of our people working. So security is in the mind and eye of the beholder. Uh, A security expert has a much different opinion about what can fly versus, uh, let's say, somebody in business affairs who is more interested in profitability and things like that. So you have to, and my opinion, moving forward, a lot of the harsh, really restrictive security is going to lighten up um, or at least be looked at in a different light moving forward. That's my thoughts. 
JJ. Uh, I would also throw out that um, because well, well, a couple things. One is because in order for RGS to you know work and function, it needs to be behind a firewall on a VPN. So you've already established some security in, in that regard, and that um, gives you know some comfort. I'm completely with Mark, where we're in the same situation. This is this is not uh, you know feature work in general. Um, additionally. Uh, seeing as you're talking about Mark, the, the standards, I wouldn't say laxed, but maybe being readdressed, you know, as we're seeing, uh, the, uh, requirements from networks when it comes to remote, uh, particularly like, you know, thumbing through Netflix's big, you know, breakdown of what they're comfortable with. It's vastly different than what it, what it was before. And that's just the nature of the beast, you know, keep in order to keep functioning in order to keep people's jobs, some of that did have to, uh, you know, become a little bit less uh, of an important uh, characteristic. But uh, moving forward, I'm sure that those are going to start to um, kind of refine and taking drives home is going to be a little bit different of a process. And when we're when we're when we're starting from, you know, actual production point of view uh, and working into post, I think it'll probably change. Yeah, I think it's the, you know, it's the people that you're sending home, like Mark's people and our people that we trust those people. Uh, we trust them with the content. Uh, we're also not, you know, doing high security stuff, so we're not under those restrictions. But you know, there's always it's a, no matter how secure you're going to try and make something, there's someone's going to find a way around that. You know, if they're even they're on an RGS, they can just um, shoot the screen and and post that from their phone. I mean, it's yeah. There's got to be some balance between keeping people employed, as you say, and and um, and security. The, and that, that's the that's the interesting piece there because while like an RGS or an edit on demand, all the cloud uh, zero client workflows are inherently secure in their tran transport. You know, uh, I can get a picture of Mark right now. Um, that's 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 the core problem. And I was on a webinar. Uh, uh, it might have been a month ago. Could I don't know. Time doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, a year ago, <laughs> where, where the, the 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 guy who was in charge of TPN was saying, "Hey, well, yeah, we can come out and assess your home," which uh, uh, okay, but I mean, uh, is everybody going to go through that entire process? And I I think that will also dictate what parts of the industry go back to the way it was, and what parts can continue working. Uh, you know, far flung and and uh, distributed, um, with you know ties back to the the central core. It, it really, I think, will depend upon the level of security that people are going to be required to do. Uh, I mean, if you if you're cutting, you know, like one of these type of movies behind me, then yeah, you're going to have to have a different level of security than if you're if you're working on certain other projects. Yeah, but Jeff, they're even on high level. You know, the VFX community is starting to ramp and push back against all these restrictions because, you know, their workflow is distributed and they're drastically affected by this sort of thing. So I, I think up and down the scale from smallest project to largest blockbuster, there's going to be a lot of reconsidering of what security means. We're not saying throw it all away, but Definitely. let's be sensible about it. And I think one of the other things that also will be in there is, okay, if a facility says, oh, we're doing, they sign off on the security level, it's the facility that's on the hook. If I'm cutting a movie at my house because it's remote and I'm on the hook and it's, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the cost for a breach is, you know, insurmountable for me as an individual, that, that piece, you know, the lawyers will have to figure that out. So a uh, couple, we've got a room for a couple more questions. Um, one, th one thing that came up twice is Mark, how are you handling, uh, producer reviews of cuts? Wow. Okay. So work from home is not just editing. It's review and approval. It's digitizing up and down. It's assistant work. It's finishing. So we've had to employ multiple different solutions for all that. Um, we're fans of Sony C, that's Sony CI, that's similar to Frame.io or Media Silo or any of the other review and approval sites out there. Um, and it's basically a asynchronous process where the editor works, outputs a cut, puts it up on a review and approval site, gets notes, comes back. 
Um, I recognize that there are other options like, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, um, where you can play and somebody can watch it um, synchronously. That's not really how it works in our business. Um, so it's really make a cut, post it, watch it, get notes. Understandable. Any other? JJ, you had your... Uh, you know, for one, that's, I think, ultimately what we're really going to rely on editorial management for is allowing, uh, because not only is it just remote review and approval, but it's also more robust than a, a typical one if you're, if you're going through Frame.io or something, because you can actually add locators and you can, uh, you know, do a, a, a cut in a, a shot if you wanted to, or even grab uh, clips and put them in a bin. So it gives, it's actually a, a benefit to be working with, with that product. Um, but also, uh, you know, Mark's absolutely right. There's this whole other phase of, of everything post-production that is not just related to, to editorial. Um, you might have been referring to uh, Evercast. We've been using Evercast pretty frequently. We've been using um, uh, Clearview Flex, uh, Streambox. Th those tend to be more for lead edit and possibly finishing. Some of those options are really cool because you can uh, you can not only play out uh, to iPads or to people's laptops, but you can actually go to an external box, connect that box to uh, like an LG C8 or C9 monitor and really replicate what you're seeing in the, in the, in the finishing bay. So there are those options floating around and, and it, none, none of it's really standardized yet. But um, again, that kind of brings us back to RGS2 because that just alleviates a very good portion of that. I think we'll always see on-premises storage with either VMs or some kind of uh, instance of Media Composer that, that's running on-premises that people are accessing because it makes that whole process considerably easier. So um, that that a answers one of the other questions that D that Dean had put out there, Dean Evans. Uh, remote workflow for po colorists possible? Yes, Streambox can do that. Um, check with us later. We can, we can hook you up on that. Um, and then uh, one question that popped up, to uh, again, um, a lot of people have the same questions. I wonder why. Um, is there a way to have projects with bin locking in the cloud, but then work with local media? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing. I mean, you know, a tip of the hat to Dave and Avid. I mean, that is the one differentiating factor between Avid and just about any other NLA out there, which is the ability to share projects, share workflow, and not get confused about who's doing what where. Um, hats off to our assistant editor teams who have really been keeping this going for us and to address the possible, <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, confusion. Um, but so, yeah. And I mean, I leave it to Dave to, to describe how, but, um, yes, is the quick answer. You got it. You can do it. It's all magic, but it, it definitely is possible. I'll say that uh, <clears throat> one other comment there is of all the customer discussions that Dave and I have had over the last two months, if I were to point at the number one ask that we get the most frequently is what Mark just pointed at, uh, or what the question was just pointing at, um, is the, the media composer project itself in the cloud, with the storage being distributed more um, in a more diverse way than just the cloud itself. And that a lot, a lot of that comes from the, the sort of the, immediate need that we all had to put systems into into service right when the COVID thing um, became a clear reality for everyone. Uh, so that, that's the number one ask, at least in, in as far as the conversations that Dave and I have been having. Um, I'll, I'll simply say we're, we're um, looking very carefully at that. And there may be some third-party solutions coming out with something shortly, not to say any forward-looking statements. Um, uh, so getting into, uh, I think, our last question, which was tossed to um, Scott. Uh, going forward, what's the plan f for managing a large server room with remote servers and massive amounts of storage, transcoders, ingest stations, et cetera? Someone still has to do that. How is it going to change for production companies? Yeah, uh, somebody still still have to do that, and um, someone has been doing that. Um, so, you know, we're not 100% remote. There's still somebody in the building most every day to push a button. Um, I A lot of that is actually already uh, remote, so I don't know that there's a huge transition for it. 
but I don't know you'll ever get away 100% from having somebody in the server room uh, or able to go into the server room um, to help, you know, everything keep going. Yeah, until it's until it's fully cloud stable, right? There's servers in the cloud, then you, you'll get there. But there'll always be the need for someone to push the button, button until you actually don't have the building anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, I think it's more because you can push the button virtually. It's getting the card inserted into the reader. That's the big challenge. Exactly. This, you still have to do that somewhere. JJ? I was just going to say that one other thing that's really, really valuable and it just happened to, you know, sort of coincide with, um, you know, five years ago, we didn't really have established remote access to most of the servers and most of the facilities. And now, I mean, we can access switches, we can access servers, we can really, like you're saying, Jeff, we can tackle just about anything remotely other than the APC's off, you got to turn that back on or, or you need to put a card in or, or mount a drive. But we're very fortunate on that front to be able to do a lot of those things just from uh, you know, the technicians' uh, uh, homes. Yeah, APC has automatable PDUs for racks as well. So I just have to convince the clients to buy them. <laughs> yeah, it's just they're just money can fix a lot of yeah, things. It's strange not. how that works. All right. Cool. Well, uh, I, I've run out of questions to ask, and I wanted to thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time to join us today and you know talk about you know what your challenges have been. Um, and, you know, Keycode's glad to host these sorts of forums. Uh, there was one last question about what forums there are. There's different things on, on Facebook. There's, you know, the post chat. There's uh, Blue Collar Post, Avid Editors of Facebook, the Avid L2, uh, my personal favorite, um, and, um, you know, different forums on LinkedIn as well. So there are places to reach out for, for help, and if you, um, you know, need some other solutions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Keycode. We'll, we'll get you hooked up. Uh, again, thanks to the panel for taking the time and uh, hope everyone has a great and safe day.